Behold the Lamb, Chapter 1, Substitution. Then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or the flock. He shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of the meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. Leviticus 1, 1 through 3. Whatever has a defect you shall not offer, for it will not be accepted for you. Leviticus 22, 20. Substitutes. As an adolescent growing up in the public school system, I enjoyed arriving in class once in a while to see a substitute teacher at the desk. We students considered it as a free day to goof off, or at least have some breathing time until the real one came back to realign us again with the scheduled work and goals. The poor substitute was at the mercy of trying to gain respect within a 45-minute time period, a difficult accomplishment amongst teenagers. She or he was only there to fill in temporarily and therefore, in our minds, powerless to affect our grades or outcome in the class. An inferior understudy, to say the least. Within our consumer world, we would find inferior substitutes as well. Imitation salt, artificial sweeteners and flavorings, veneer, vinyl fencing, silver-plated jewelry, chrome-coated fixtures, all take the place of the real thing. Often we replace it because the real thing is too impractical, requires more care, but mostly because it's too costly. In much the same way, the blood of animals was a temporary and inferior substitute, and yet a substitute nonetheless. In fact, through the sacrificial institution, God was teaching Israel the concept of substitution in a very real and tangible way, thus preparing them for when the true, authentic, superior sacrifice would be offered once for all time by the sacrifice of Christ. For by one offering he is perfected for all time those who are sanctified. The fundamental idea behind the sacrificial system was substitution. Morning and evening the blood was spilt, the smoke would rise, and their lives were spared because there was a beast offered on the altar in place of themselves. However, the blood of bulls and goats offered only a temporary solution to the Jew. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. In the past decade, our nation has been faced with economic hardship. Many have lost homes and others are looking at bankruptcy. They are faced with enormous debt and no possibility of paying off those debts. Our hearts have been warmed by shows such as Extreme Makeover, Home Edition, which offered incredible hope and relief for one fortunate deserving family. Their home is not all that was reconstructed, but very often their mortgages were fully paid and their kids were given a free ride to college. The value of the gifting was beyond overwhelming to those who weeks earlier were in such a struggle. Due to many sacrifices on the part of others, it all not only became possible, but reality. We are all in debt, not only with our mortgages and credit card bills, but an even greater debt that has been passed on throughout mankind's existence a debt that must be paid, the debt of sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Sin has a cost, a consequence. The wages of sin is death. In order to appreciate the sacrifice of the substitute, the debt must be recognized. What is sin after all? And why is it accounted to the charges against me? Am I such a horrible person? I'm basically good-hearted. I try to do the right thing, pay my taxes, be polite, lead a good and quality life. Why then do I need to drag myself in the mire of that filthy, rotten, scum-of-the-earth sinner complex of which the legalistic church does such a masterful job? Sin is anything that is in opposition to God and his holy nature. Sin is the black hole of the absence of God's presence. It is anything raised up against the knowledge of God and his will. 
Sin separates us from God, as explicitly depicted in the banishment of Adam and Eve from the garden after they disobeyed. <clears throat> they had enjoyed walking in fellowship with God in the place of paradise, but had to leave his presence and his glory because sin entered their lives. Jesus even attributed impure thoughts as sin. They are reflections of our propensity to go against God and go our own way, accomplishing our own will apart from his. Our thoughts can bear witness to the presence of our natural inclination towards sin. God gave us the freedom of choice in the hope that we would choose to love him. Unfortunately, along with that freedom, we have the ability to choose sin instead. With the fall of Adam and Eve, sin entered the world and the hearts of mankind. None are exempt. Not only do we need to recognize the debt of sin in ourselves, but we need to acknowledge that the debt must be paid. We look at the trillions of dollars owed to our national debt and act as though it's a part of the status quo, but it will not go away until it is all paid. The dilemma of our sin debt is that we simply cannot pay it. No man can ransom himself, Scripture says, or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of his life is costly and can never suffice. Our sin debt is too great. Our substitutes are too inefficient. The real price is too costly for us to pay. The price of our freedom can only be paid by one who is not in debt himself. Only one who is free from debt has the ability and the resources to pay. Only a perfect, unblemished substitute can be our ultimate sacrifice. Clear sill and makeup. Most of us prefer not to look at ourselves as ugly, much less sinful, especially in a world that emphasizes self-worth through outward appearance, an appearance of power and success, or beauty and popularity. To be admired, to be liked, to be esteemed, all are contained in, in this innate desire within the human soul. It's not only who wins the Academy Award, it's who looks the best on the red carpet. Because of this, we have a tendency to hide ourselves. We don't want any exterior blemishes which might expose who we really are or how we really perceive ourselves. We feel the eyes of the critics always upon us. So we apply our Clearasil or cover-up makeup, or on a more extreme level, have plastic surgery. We hide our weaknesses and faults like we hide our physical blemishes. Seeking the adulation of others takes the place of acceptance of ourselves and creates a dependency on opinions not our own, much less God's. It doesn't help us then when Jesus wraps up chapter 5 in Matthew by saying, Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. How can I feel anything but despair? Oswald Chambers writes, Beware of placing our Lord as teacher first. If Jesus Christ is a teacher only, then all he can do is to tantalize me by erecting a standard I cannot attain. What's the use of presenting me with an ideal I cannot possibly come near? I am happier without knowing it. What is the good of telling me to be what I never can be, to be pure in heart, to do more than my duty, to be perfectly devoted to God? <clears throat> I must know Jesus Christ as Savior before his teaching has any meaning for me other than that of an ideal which leads to despair. So, instead of recognizing our need, our pride tries to mask our imperfections. We try to perform well, but we can't admit we fall short of the mark. If we try to lead the perfect life but fail in one area, we become guilty. Scripture says, Forever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. God's standard is too high. So what do we do? We either give up, ignore it, run from it, or try to jump higher. Humanly speaking, there's not much else we can do. God's law stated that the sacrificial animal, the substitute, had to be without blemish. No diseases, no broken bones or crippled legs, perfect in every way. The law was the law. The justice of God stands. 
when the Roman soldiers came upon the body of Jesus on the cross, they were about to break his legs to speed up his death. This was the customary practice. They were especially in a hurry at Jesus' crucifixion because it was Passover, as well as the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, plus the Sabbath was approaching. No work could be done on any Sabbath or any holy feast day. However, when the soldiers came to the Christ, he had already offered up his spirit and was dead. So they passed by without breaking his legs. His legs were left whole and unblemished, perfect in every way. He was the unblemished offering, the unblemished Passover lamb, both of which required that no bones be broken. Besides a physical fulfillment, more importantly, Jesus met the moral and spiritual requirement. The Apostle Peter tells us we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. The writer of Hebrews tells us Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. And after John baptized Jesus, a voice from heaven declared, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And again on the Mount of Transfiguration, the voice of God thunders out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. It was clear that the sacrifice was unblemished and accepted by God the Father. The payment of the debt of sin had to be made by a perfect, faultless substitute sacrifice. We are certainly are aware if we are to meet the perfection standard indicated by the law, then we had to either mask ourselves better, which accomplishes nothing, or surrender. If we try harder, then we are believing we can attain a righteousness of our own based on the standard, and that Christ's death was insufficient as well as needless. Present. In order for the unblemished substitute to be accepted by the Lord, it had to be presented to him, first at the door of the tent of meeting of the tabernacle, or after the reign of David at the entrance to the great court of the temple. This was the place the Lord had designated, saying, I will meet there with the sons of Israel, and it shall be consecrated by my glory. The substitute was to be brought by the worshiper personally with his own hands for his own sacrifice. Or in the case of public sacrifices, the priest would present it to the Lord for the entire nation. Only at the tabernacle or temple was it acknowledged as a valid sacrifice to the Lord. In fact, if anyone were to offer a sacrifice anywhere else but in front of the Lord, he would be cut off from his people and would be guilty of shedding innocent blood. There is only one altar. There is only one way of salvation. Salvation is only possible in the presence of the Lord, and sacrifice was the acceptable means of approaching a holy God. It was also there at the doorway where it was determined if the substitute was acceptable, unblemished, and pleasing to the Lord, that it might be offered on the holy altar. We have to wonder, when was Jesus presented? Well, after Jesus was born, at the end of the allotted time for the mother's purification, Mary and Joseph traveled to Jerusalem and came and presented Jesus at the temple to be dedicated. According to the right of the firstborn son, he was offered to the Lord. Whether it was the first fruit of the harvest or the firstborn of the womb, it belonged to God. At the age of 12, Jesus was again found in the temple, amazing the teachers by his understanding of Scripture. During his three years of ministry, Jesus was continually found in the temple, teaching day after day. And all the people would get up early in the morning to come to him in the temple to listen to him. Jesus presented himself, the Lamb of God, at the temple as the atoning sacrifice, not only for the entire nation of Israel, but the entire world. As John the Baptist testified, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Jesus presented himself to Jerusalem, entering the city amidst waving palm branches, knowing he had come to be the sacrificial scapegoat which paid for the sins of public ignorance. Centuries earlier, the prophet Zechariah predicted his coming by saying, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The month was the month of the new king's reign, the inauguration of his highness. But Jesus wept over Jerusalem because they did not recognize the time of their visitation. They wanted a king who would free them from being under Roman rule, not one who would free them from their debt of sin. It was a special day not only for kings, but also for lambs. For this was the day that everyone was to select the lamb which would serve as their Passover lamb several days later. Jesus presented himself as their king, making his way to the temple only to become their sacrifice. They hailed him as king, not knowing they had also picked out their lamb. He was the lamb that Israel selected that day, showered with shouts of Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The remainder of the Old Testament verse that they quoted reads, We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. They were soon to do just that. After the triumphal procession, Jesus proceeded to enter the temple, knowing that this was the place where the Passover lamb would be found acceptable and valid to make payment. A few days later, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the Roman cohort, the priests and Pharisees sought him for arrest, Jesus voluntarily gave himself over, presenting himself, saying, I am he. And on the cross, Jesus presented himself to the Father. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And bowing his head, he breathed his last. And ultimately, after his death, resurrection, and ascension, Jesus presented himself to the Father in the greater and more perfect tabernacle into heaven itself. Jesus presented himself voluntarily in obedience to the Father, personally with his own scarred hands an innocent life for the sins of the world. The sacrifice not only needed to be presented, but it must be brought personally by the worshiper with his own hands. It needed to be his own lamb, a personal sacrifice. God came into this world personally himself, in Jesus, bringing a lamb for the whole world from his own flock. Jesus was offered as a gift from the Father to the world at his earthly temple, and Jesus then offered himself back to the Father at his heavenly temple in the hope that we would choose to receive this gift. But we must present ourselves to the Lord. We must come to his temple, into his presence. We must come personally with our own hands bringing the one and only Lamb of God as the basis for our salvation. We must come individually. No one can come for us. No one can receive salvation and forgiveness for us. We must come, you must come, of your own free will. The Lord made it clear to the Israelites that if anyone sacrificed an animal without bringing it to the doorway of the tabernacle before God, he would be cut off from his people. It was a serious matter. God's people were forbidden to perform sacrifices in the way of the surrounding heathen nations. It was an issue of idolatry. There were high places, hillsides, that were used to sacrifice to the many gods that were worshipped by the ancient civilizations who lived in the land of Canaan during the time of Moses. The Hittites, Amorites, and Malachites, they all sacrificed to false gods even offering their own children sometimes upon their altars. God did not want his people deceived and tempted into such deranged insolence. Sacrificing to the gods of wood and stone does not result in the reception of grace and mercy. 
Isaiah records the dilemma of the man who's carved an idol of wood. He says, no one recalls, nor is there any knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire and have also baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it. Then I make the rest of it into an abomination, a god. I fall down before a block of wood. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside. The tabernacle of God's presence was the only place where they could come to be forgiven, the only place where they could be cleansed, the only place where their sacrifice would be accepted. It is with great anguish to have to say that he came to his own and his own received him not. Jesus was hailed as king by waving palm branches and then was rejected a few days later by shouts of crucify him. The Jewish religious leaders did not follow the protocol of giving him a fair trial, but gave him a rebel beating and a death sentence. Never did they approach the temple with a sacrifice, but they stealthily skirted all liturgical law, presenting Christ to Pilate and Herod, anyone but the Lord God Almighty. They did not acknowledge him as their sacrifice, and that is why Jesus wept. That is why the Apostle Paul wept. But because of their rejection, salvation has come to the rest of the world. And if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? They will someday look on him whom they pierced and believe. They will recognize their Messiah and receive their original role as priesthood, along with all who believe. For that is how God intends it to be, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, all are one in Christ. I am personally looking forward with anticipation to that day when my older Jewish brother, the nation of Israel, receives its rightful inheritance and shares in the salvation God has planned for centuries. After all, the Jews gave us Jesus. And for that, I will ever be so thankful. No way around. My son loves the movies. He has a keen eye for the art of film, which has made me appreciate this art form much more. Once in a while, we get the chance to go to the theater together. Going to the theater has changed a bit since I was a girl. It used to be that you had to buy your ticket outside of the building, and you couldn't even get into the lobby without it. Right at the door was this turnstile, and there was no getting around it. Payment had to be made first. There's no getting around the entrance into God's presence, either. Payment had to be made at the bronze altar, the great altar, in front of the tabernacle, and later in Israel's history in the court of the temple. Both structures represented the presence of God dwelling with man. In order to approach the Holy One of Israel, the abode of God, payment had to be made at the entrance, the slaying of the sacrificial animal. It was as though God put a great turnstile in front of his sanctuary. The great altar was the first structure seen upon entering. God placed it in full view. That's some foyer decor. Can you imagine putting your barbecue in front of your front door? Before you can enter the sanctuary of God's presence, before you can enter the holy place of the Lord, you have to deal with the altar first. There's no getting around it. There's no getting around the entrance to eternal life and into the presence of the Father for us either. There's no getting around the death of Christ. The altar stands in the way. The night before his death, Jesus beseeched the Father in so much agony that the gospel writer Luke tells us his sweat became like great drops of blood falling. He implored the Father to remove the penalty of death from him if there was another way around it. Three times he inquired, and three times he acquiesced to the Father's will. There was no other way. There was no other way to end the bloodshed of bulls and goats. No other way to make appeasement of God's justice. There was no other way to perfectly satisfy the law or to make a complete atonement and eternal redemption except by the blood of a perfect, 
innocent life. The question is, how are you trying to gain entrance? What is the sacrifice you are bringing? Are you like Cain, who proudly brought the harvest of his own labors? Perhaps you're trying to pay with a few good things you've done in your life? Or are you bringing the real price of admission? In the Old Testament book of Esther, a drama is played out demonstrating God's providence as well as his justice without God being mentioned by name. The wicked Haman is an allegorical embodiment of Satan, and he's given power and authority by the king of Persia over the provinces. Because of his hatred of Mordecai, a particular Jew who will not bow down to him, Haman convinces the king to create an edict to have all the Jews in the land exterminated. He tells the king that they do not observe the king's laws, so it is not in the interest of the king for them to remain. So the king gives Haman his signet ring, which puts the royal seal on the law, signifying that the law is valid. Unbeknownst to the king, his beloved Queen Esther is a Jewess herself. She ultimately reveals her heritage to the king, and in the end, justice is served. Haman is hanged, but the law is still on the books. The Jews will be exterminated on a certain day. The edict was signed and sealed, and there was no revoking it. In the following months, Mordecai, who is a Christ-like figure, is given the place of authority which Haman had, and his reputation and honor becomes great. He then convinces the king to pass a new edict, which will enable the Jews to assemble themselves and fight against anyone who would try to kill them on the extermination date. God gives the Jews victory. Mordecai is exalted, and the Feast of Purim is established as a remembrance of the event to this day. As for us, the law is still on the books. The wages of sin is death. Death for us is imminent because of the presence of sin. There's no way around it. However, because God is not only just but also merciful, he passes a new edict upon the request of his right-hand man. For this reason, he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed on the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Signed, sealed, and delivered, Jesus paid the price of the old edict, establishing a new edict, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it away, having nailed it to the cross. A while ago, my family and I went out to a nice restaurant, and like always, my father insisted on treating us. And due to faulty eyesight and a little bit of senior lapse, my father tried to pay with it with his department store credit card. We all had a good laugh over it, but it certainly would not pay the bill. What are you presenting to the Lord? Are you trying to substitute your own goodness to pay the cost of your sin? Are you trying to pay your way with a few good things you've done in life? That's using the wrong card, much less paying the right price. There's no getting around it. Lean on me. The film, The Man in the Iron Mask, based on the Alexander Dumas novel, portrayed an exchange of two kings. They were identical twins in looks, but not in heart. The evil brother, zealous of the throne, imprisoned his twin and kept him in the confines of an iron mask so that his identity would not be revealed. For years, the secret was kept, and the French public knew nothing about the existence of a brother. Only Artemis, one of the former king's musketeers, and the queen knew the truth. When it became evident that the reigning brother had no regard for the welfare of his starving regime, Artemis disclosed the secret to his comrades, the other musketeers. They successfully endeavored to release the twin in bondage. In the end, the formerly imprisoned brother, who had integrity and uprightness of heart, was convinced to take on the king's identity and imprison his brother for the sake of France. 
The evil twin was then the one who was put into seclusion and demoted from power and put in the iron mask. An exchange of identities had been made. In a similar way, an exchange of identities took place at the altar of sacrifice. Not only was the unblemished sacrifice presented to the Lord personally by the worshiper, but it had to be acknowledged as his substitute by laying of the hands on the head of the animal. Scripture says, He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. In all of the private offerings made by the individual, the worshiper laid his entire weight upon the head of the animal, either confessing his sins or offering a prayer of praise, depending upon what kind of sacrifice was being performed. The demonstration of laying the hands on the head of the animal symbolized that a transference was made. The worshiper was making a symbolic gesture to acknowledge the animal as his substitute and transfer his sins to the animal. Not only his sins, but it was as though he actually transferred his identity as the sinner onto the animal. The animal was an innocent personal substitution representing him. It was a portrayal which made it clear that it should have been the worshiper himself on that altar instead. Scripture says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I don't know about you, but I think we got the better end of the deal. He gets our sin, and we receive his righteous standing with God. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, Scripture tells us. If you have believed and accepted that fact, then you have placed your hands on the head of Jesus, acknowledged him as your substitute, transferred your sins onto him, and received a new identity of righteousness back. Not your own identity, but his. Not based on your own so-called good life, but based on his. He has now reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, an incredible and miraculous exchange that fulfilled God's perfect standard. Are you holy and blameless? Positionally speaking, yes, if you've given your life to Christ. Therefore, we need to view ourselves as God does. If you view yourself as a filthy, rotten sinner, then that will have an effect on how you act and live. As Neil Anderson writes, no person can consistently behave in a way that's inconsistent with the way he perceives himself. Christ is your righteousness. Practically speaking, we need to hold fast to the head, to his lordship. Colossians says, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, taking his stand on visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. And you have come to fullness of life in him who is the head of all rule and authority. The idea of lordship today sounds like some kind of medieval serfdom, an antiquated Camelot, that doesn't exist in this cosmopolitan world of independence and self-sufficiency. Yet, we all have lords. We laugh at the poor Old Testament sap who bows to a block of wood, but we're guilty of idol worship of different lords. The lord of the credit card. The lord of the video game. The lord of the bottle. The lord of the mortgage. The lord of religiosity. The lord of self-deprecation. The lord of self-aggrandizement. Wherever your treasure is, wherever your mind dwells, there will your Lord be. In Paul's day, people worshipped angels and idols and inflicted bodily harm to themselves to beat their flesh into submission. In our day, we worship American idols, marble saints, helpless creatures, and our own goodness. Lordship is lost by delusion, worshipping the creature rather than the creator. The truth is, it's not just believing in God, but it's receiving him as Lord. 
James says, you believe God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. The demons knew who Jesus was. What's the difference between their standing and mine? Lordship. They refuse his lordship. Holding fast to the head of all rule and authority in this world and universe is the only trustworthy Lord unto whom we can hold. It's only through him that we gain salvation and righteousness, and only through receiving his lordship do we gain the relationship with God that he desires for us to have. It's a relationship based on love and trust, which produces a growth of gratitude, surrender, and a desire to please. Hold fast to the head. He is your life. He is your truth. He is the sovereign creator, king. Placing your hands on his head was an acceptance of his exchange, his lordship, his headship, his coronation in your life. Now, we may try to softly lay one hand on the head while the other dangles in non-committal fashion, wondering if there isn't something else upon which our salvation depends. But until we put our whole weight into trusting Christ's death is sufficient, his sacrifice will hold little meaning. The word for lay the hands was kamak, which meant to lean, take hold, lie hard, rest yourself, Stand fast. Now, I've had a few opportunities to hold on to baby calves, and it's amazing how strong they can be. In the case of cattle for the offerings, these animals were about a year old, so I'd imagine it would take a lot of heavy leaning. Are you putting all of your weight and bearing on the all-sufficiency of Christ's death? Are you resting on him as your substitute and him alone? Lean on him. Not only did the worshiper identify the animal as his substitute, acknowledge the death as payment, and recognize the transferal of sin, he also placed his hands as a form of blessing. In Old Testament times, when the patriarch of the family was about ready to die, he would pronounce a blessing over his child. And blessings were generally extended by meaningful touch on the head. They proclaimed value to the person and spoke of future hope over the person's life. Scripture says, Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your holy hands to the place and bless the Lord. We offer blessing, but what did the world lay on Christ's head? A crown of thorns, a barbed cursing. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. He who should have had the prayer of blessings and repentance spoken over him was cursed and mocked by the world, and we ended up receiving the blessing. Bless him for his forgiveness, for his sweet love, mercy, and grace. Bless him for giving me impunity. Bless him for taking my place. Bless him for being my righteousness. Bless him for being my perfect substitute. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name.